American fascism doesn't look like Polish fascism, doesn't look like German fascism, doesn't look like Russian fascism, but the fascism is the same. The character of it is the same. The nature of it is the same. It is Monday, April the 1st. There are 217 days left until the American people will make a decision that shapes the destiny of the United States. I am in Warsaw, Poland, and this is the warning. I stepped out of my hotel the other day and turned right and started walking towards Warsaw's old town, past the presidential palace. The first thing I noticed, different than most European capitals, is there was no evidence of English being spoken anywhere. I heard none, not a word. I was walking and I heard many different languages. I heard Ukrainian, I heard Polish, I heard Russian but no English. A little bit down the street, I came upon a rally. There was an ominous music playing, percussive. The bass was reverberating, pounding. Dread was the tone I could best describe it as. In front of a poster which featured a pure, blue-eyed, golden blonde young girl, then juxtaposed against a darkened image, a different future, were laying dozens of body bags. There were black uniformed members of the political party associated with the event handing out flyers. I knew exactly what it was. I could not read a word of the language. I could not understand a word that was spoken. And yet I knew precisely what it was that I was seeing. That is something that I think about often at the warning and through all of my commentary over what incredibly is now almost a decade. The Trump era has lasted nine years. I was in my early 40s when it began, and now I'm in my early 50s. It rolls on. But we are at a very different place nine years later from where all of this started when Donald Trump came down the escalator, promising a campaign of hate, insinuating that Mexicans who come to America are all rapists and murderers. And it's been all downhill from there. I've always had a lot of intention about the words I use. They have meaning. They have purpose. I don't use them frivolously. If I use a term like annihilate, it's because I'm trying to convey a certain type of destruction. If I use words like savagery and brutality, I'm trying to convey despicable and horrific acts. If I use the word fascist, I don't use it lightly because to do so would dishonor the dead that the fascists killed and murdered in the middle of the 20th century. I am in Warsaw and I am next to the old town. It is one of humanity's greatest achievements. It's rebuilding. It was rubbleized, turned to ash and dust on purpose, for vengeance and retribution because of an uprising against Nazi rule and against Nazi occupation by the brave people of Poland. When the war was over, it was rebuilt brick by brick. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. But the thing is, if you were to walk around the downtown as a young person without knowledge, of the history. It would seem that this medieval city has existed in perpetuity, uninterrupted for a day by violence or dread or death or occupation. There is no signs unless you look closely for what happened. But there on a wall is a marker. 150 poles were lined up against the wall and shot here. 
And there's another one, 200 more killed here. And here was where the Jews rose up and fought. Everywhere there are pockmarked buildings scarred by bullet holes from the fighting. Tremendous savagery and violence was done in Poland by fascism, by the fascists. And so when I came upon that rally and I saw the black uniforms and I saw the symbolism, I saw the iconography, I saw the subdued swastikas, I knew exactly what it was. I didn't have to wait. Just like I didn't have to wait to make judgments about the Patriot Front or the Oath Keepers or the Proud Boys, because they're all part of the same movement, part of the same cause. When you see this truck on an American highway, what this is, is American Taliban. This isn't normal in politics, but this is four-wheel drive fascism. That truck in the convoy and many more like it, which we'll see over the months ahead, is designed to intimidate, to threaten, to menace. The flags off the back, the thin blue line on the black and white American flag, the Blue Lives Matter flag, a flag that supposedly denotes an affiliation and affinity for law enforcement, flying from a truck that has an image of the hogtied president of the United States, kidnapped, no doubt on his way to a imaginary execution. Well, the simple truth is this. Donald Trump has incited violence in America for many years now. And he's caused violence in America. And he will cause more political violence in America. When you see an image like this of the president of the United States hogtied in the back of a pickup truck, does it offend you? Does it offend you that the leader of the free world, the office of the president of the United States, that its dignity is so disrespected? Donald Trump does not admire the values of freedom and liberty. So when he looks at a Swede or a Norwegian or a Czech or a Pole or a German that believes in an idea that has lit the world, that we're all created equally, endowed by a higher creator, a power beyond our comprehension with rights, life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness, this is the great fault line of humanity. The people who live on one side of freedom and people who are trapped, imprisoned on another. A great contestation is underway again in the world between those forces, between the forces of freedom and slavery, between fascism and democracy. And it's a competition that's just beginning. It's important to recognize what it is that you see. Can you see the fascism directly in front of you? Can you see the threat? Do you know what it means when someone promises vengeance and retribution? Can you smell the death at hand? Because it will come. All of this has meaning. It's playing out in a moment in time at the edge of an era of history that is ending with the lifespans of the people who survived history's greatest cataclysm, the Second World War. Millions were killed, 80 million people around the world. And when that event was over and freedom won, everybody understood that humanity would not survive the next war. That what had occurred could never be forgotten, that it must always be remembered so it could never happen again. You do not have to walk far, not in Poland, not in America, to see the signs of a rising in incipient fascism, a new fascism, a new darkness. It is in Hungary. It is in Russia, an access rising between North Korea, China, Russia, and Iran that is inimically hostile to the concepts of freedom, pluralism, equality, and liberty that bind people all over the world who 
who demand to live in humanity's natural state. And that condition is freedom. A time of testing is coming. A great choice is ahead for the American people. 217 days. The American people will literally hold in their hands the destiny of generations of Americans who are unborn. The choice will be between a man who believes in an idea that is at the core of all human progress, freedom, and one who does not. The one who does not is named Donald Trump. What he believes in is power for himself, for himself. His supporters have grown fanatical, and that fanaticism is dangerous. When you see an image like this, an image of violence, know that they mean it. They always do. Fascists are violence. Violence is fascism. It killed tens of millions, and it's rising again. It's incumbent on all of us to be able to recognize it. Our survival depends on it. 217 days to go, and this is the warning. Thank you for listening to my political commentary. If you like what you heard today, please also consider subscribing to The Warning, daily newsletter on Substack.